Ladies and gentlemen, it is your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs with a good old fashioned no frills video about the way the Titanic worked. Now, for all intents and purposes, the Titanic was essentially a giant floating steel box designed to ferry passengers from one side to the other of one of the harshest marine environments on the planet, the North Atlantic Ocean. In this part of the globe, temperatures can drop to as low as 3 degrees Celsius or 37 degrees Fahrenheit and waves can reach the height of a 10 story building. It's a harsh and cruel body of water, but how on earth do you make passengers comfortable for the entire duration of their six day voyage on your ship? Ocean liners like Titanic used a number of methods to draw in fresh air, heat passenger cabins and rooms, and even cool down parts of the ship that needed it. Here is how they heated and cooled the Titanic. Now I just know one of you is going to make some kind of water cooling joke if I ask how they cooled down the Titanic, so I'll just preempt that now. But it's not entirely far off the mark. Steam and water were used in conjunction to regulate the temperature of Titanic's rooms to keep things comfortable for occupants. Now, I already mentioned that the Titanic was essentially a giant steel box. The ship's hull was made of steel frames clad with steel plating that was around an inch thick. And although this sounds fairly hefty, it isn't much when you consider on the reverse side of that steel plating is the vast freezing cold Atlantic Ocean. The design brief Titanic's engineers stuck to was to make Titanic feel, to first and second class passengers at least, like they were staying in a hotel and not a ship. To that end, the ship had to be nice and warm, even in the middle of the coolest Atlantic winter. But it's not just a question of heat. Imagine how stuffy a ship could become without fresh air being circulated through it. The interiors of ships are cavernous spaces, but with 2,200 people living in close proximity to one another, the air could fast become stale and very unpleasant. In the days of old, sailing ships had a real problem with this. Conditions for fair paying passengers were nothing short of horrendous, with the ship's rotten bilge water permeating the air. Now, to get fresh air into the ship, uh, shipwrights installed these things called cowl vents. And even though you may not be familiar with the name, I'm sure you've seen them before because their shape is iconic. Rounded and kind of L shaped at the top to prevent rainwater from entering from above, their function was really simple. You could point them into the wind and their round intake would hopefully pick up some of the fresh air and drive it down into the ship. They were totally unpowered, just relying purely on the strength of the wind, so you can imagine that sitting on a hot night in port without a gust would have been miserable. So Titanic's designers had a few challenges to overcome. First, they had to get good clean air constantly into the ship. Second, they had to heat the ship's spaces to a comfortable temperature. Third, they had to cool some parts of the ship off that naturally ran hotter. And finally, they had to get the stale and hot air out of the ship as quickly as they were pulling in the fresh air. Not entirely easy when your ship's internal volume is around 45,000 gross registered tons and divided into hundreds and hundreds of individual rooms and spaces. Here's how they did it. Titanic used two kinds of system to bring fresh air into the ship, powered and unpowered. Now, you already know that back in the day, ships had cowl vents and the crew would kind of maneuver them and point them in the direction of the wind, hoping to catch fresh air. And interestingly, Titanic had them as well. These were useful for easily getting air into rooms that weren't too far away from the top deck where the cowl vent would be placed. You see these cowl vents at the stern, they drew in fresh air for the third class general and smoking rooms directly below. You can usually tell which vents are unpowered. They usually had little handles on the sides that you could swing the vents and point them in the direction the wind was blowing. They sat on top of this thing called a combing and could rotate a full 360 degrees. I can't help but laugh sometimes. I've seen people arguing online about which direction these vents faced and even critiquing people's model kits because they put the vents on the wrong way. But really they could be posed by the crew in any direction to catch the wind. Titanic was like an 882 foot long, 10 story building. It needed a lot of fresh air and the power of the wind just wouldn't cut it. Harland and Wolf, the Titanic's builders, would need some mechanical help to get fresh air into their ship and they got it in the form of the Scirocco fan. If you've ever looked closely at the photos or paintings of Titanic, like this brilliant piece by Ken Marshall, you've probably seen all these strange looking objects scattered around the decks. I don't know, I was fascinated by them as a kid, even though I didn't know what they were. And these events, which were connected to electric fans and drew in huge volumes of fresh air down into the ship. The Scirocco vent was a 19th century refinement of a 16th century invention. The Scirocco is actually a brand name. 
so-called after a Mediterranean wind that originates in the Sahara, and the business was established in Belfast. It uses a kind of fan called a centrifugal fan, different to a ceiling fan you might be used to seeing with blades sticking out from a central point. Instead, it uses an impeller, a kind of wheel with small angled blades. The impeller spins and creates negative pressure, drawing air in and then pushing it along in a totally different direction. In the case of the Scirocco vent, the air could be drawn in through a vent cover and then sent deep down into the ship at a very fast rate. The impeller in the fan was driven by a small electric motor. They were quiet, reliable, and hugely effective. Some Scirocco fans weren't used for drawing air in, they are actually used for extracting foul air from very deep in the ship and pulling it out of the ship itself. Titanic had somewhere around 64 Scirocco vents in a dazzling array of sizes and shapes, and simply put, the bigger the fan, the more air it could draw down into the ship. This was really useful for dictating how big a fan and vent you'd need based on where the air was needed. For example, a small individual galley would only need a single, smaller cowl vent with a tiny fan, but for the larger spaces in the ship, like the dining saloon, the big 35-inch Scirocco fans on the boat deck would be needed to draw in huge amounts of air. In fact, the dining saloon is a really interesting example of a space which needed as much fresh air as it could get. It was all the way down on D-deck, quite large, but with a relatively low ceiling for a room which was intended to seat hundreds of guests for dinner. In photos, you'll notice the ship was festooned with hundreds of lights. Bulbs back then were pretty simple and they ran incredibly hot. The dining saloon on Olympic became notoriously hot at mealtimes as those lights baked the people sitting under them. There's nothing more uncomfortable to wear than Edwardian formal wear in hot weather. Trust me on that. You can tell it must have been bad because the ships were even fitted with small electric fans to get their air circulating. To account of this, a few heavy duty Scirocco fans up on the boat deck and deck houses were used to draw fresh air down and pump it throughout the room. Now the Scirocco fans also drew in fresh air to circulate amongst the passenger cabins. All cabins were reached by trunking, long ducts which were originated at the fans on the boat deck level and like the roots of a great tree, reached down into the depths of the ship and branched out into individual cabins. First class staterooms had the vents covered with decorative grills, but down in third class it was a lot more utilitarian, and you could see the trunking up on the ceiling where it sat uncovered. Of course in first and second class the trunking was usually buried behind wooden panels and decor. Another way of getting fresh air into your stateroom was to simply open your porthole, and to that end Titanic had thousands of portholes along her side, most of these swung inwards, so you'd be hoping the wind was pointing in your direction. But the ship also had a few unique types of porthole designed specifically to direct fresh air into the cabin. Of course, these were usually reserved almost exclusively for first class. The Utley Company provided their patented swiveling porthole, which didn't open inwards but swiveled to the side, meaning you could angle the glass itself out to catch the wind and funnel it into your cabin. Remember, the Titanic would be moving forward at 22 knots or so. That's 25 miles per hour or 40 km per hour breeze. Not too bad for getting fresh air into your cabin. But probably the most important rooms to get fresh air into were down in the boiler rooms. The men who worked down here had to deal with the heat of their open furnaces, the harsh physical labour involved in shoveling tons of coal, and the tons of acrid coal dust simply kicked up by their activities. It was nasty stuff, and some pretty serious Scirocco firepower was needed. First, the ship's designers installed massive vent intakes called stokehold vents at the base of Titanic's first three funnels, one facing forward and one backward. The vent literally ran straight down, like an elevator shaft, into the bottom of the ship. It was a ten-story deep shaft that terminated at the lowest decks, and here they placed the boiler room's secret weapon. Scirocco fans, but not just any Scirocco fan. These were monstrous 55-inch fans which totally dwarfed the largest 35-inch units up on the top decks. Eight of these 55-inch Stokehold Scirocco fans serviced the ship's six boiler rooms, and they drew in gallons of fresh air on a constant basis. They were driven by electric motors which could output some 30 brake horsepower, and they were also backed up by two slightly smaller 50-inch units and a couple of other smaller ones. Because the Stokehold vents ran straight into the bowels of the ship on the night of the sinking, anybody unfortunate enough to be close by would have been drawn against the grating and pinned there as water roared in to flood the empty space inside. This happened to Charles Lightoller, Titanic's second officer. He was dragged underwater and pinned to the stokehold vent intake and couldn't break free. At the very last second, a blast of hot air from below pushed him up off the grate and he was able to swim away. 
Another simple method of ventilating machine spaces was extracting hot air. Titanic's boilers and steam lines ran at enormously high temperatures into the hundreds of degrees. That meant that the machine rooms and boiler rooms were constantly subjected to hot air. Not unlike my audience. Anyway, fortunately by its very molecular nature, hot air rises. Titanic's designers harnessed this by installing vast, empty shafts uncovered at the top so that hot air could just rise up and out of the ship on its own. For the boiler rooms, Titanic had these things called fiddly grates installed at the base of the funnels just behind the stoke hold intakes. These had a simple metal grate cover on top and ran down into the boiler rooms. They could also double as an emergency escape or access point, and they had ladders which reached all the way down into the boiler rooms from the top decks. The engine room needed a natural vent too. Titanic's designers installed a big skylight deck house between funnels 3 and 4, and a shaft that ran all the way down unimpeded into the engine room. This too was covered in gangways and ladders, and provided an easy access point for the ship's engineers if they didn't want to go down through the passenger areas. In fact, the engineer's smoking room was attached to the big engine room skylight deck house on the boat deck along with their own little promenade where they could stretch their legs. At the top of the deck house were skylight covers which could be shut totally if the weather was bad, but most of the time they were locked open, in either the full open position like here or propped up in the half open position like this to prevent rain or soot from the funnels from falling in. A lot of lessons had been learned from the Olympics maiden voyage and afterwards, and it was found that there just weren't enough Scirocco vents, and those that were there were just too small to get enough fresh air down into the ship. So on Titanic, these were sized up while she was being finished, and the lessons were implemented. Olympic eventually also got enlarged Scirocco fans during a 1912 and 1913 refits, but the layout and arrangement of these was always changing. By the 1930s, the layout of Olympic's vents was almost unrecognisable to that of her 1911 configuration because they were just getting bigger and more numerous all the time. Now the designers were getting fresh air into their ship, they had to regulate the temperature so passengers would be comfortable, which was no easy task when the outside air could reach just above freezing in winter crossings. Of course, the amount of warm air being drawn into cabins was dictated by class, but not in the way that you'd think. To warm much of the air being drawn into the ship, the designers used these things called thermotanks. The thermotanks were basically giant radiators that used coiled pipes heated by steam to heat the air that was drawn over them by a fan. The air for second and third class was referred to as hot air and was heated by the thermotanks. The fresh air was drawn in with a Scirocco fan over steam pipes within the tank that heated the air up to about 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius. The fan then drew the hot air through trunking and distributed it throughout the ship. Well, the downside to this is that there was no ability to modulate the temperature. So as long as the thermo tank was on, the unit was heating the air and supplying a constant stream of 27 degrees Celsius air into the cabins and spaces. For first class though, things were a little bit different. Steam tubes were located within the boiler uptake casings and heated the air only to about 65 degrees Fahrenheit or 18 degrees Celsius. Much cooler and more comfortable. Titanic was a British ship, and 65 degrees was considered, for the time, something like room temperature is today. For Americans from states like Florida or Southern Europeans though, this just wouldn't cut it. So plenty of electric space heaters, about 500, were placed around the first class rooms, most notably on the Grand Staircase here. A few of these space heaters have even been found in the Titanic's debris field, still largely intact. Most people are surprised to learn that all but one of the fireplaces on Titanic were decorative and use electric heaters in place of a fire. The only functioning fireplace on the ship was up in the first class smoking room, and even then, only because it was easy to install a flue and chimney leading directly to the fourth funnel to get rid of the smoke. Now here's a fun little detail. You might have noticed this little decorative brass trim at floor level in rooms like the dining saloon and the smoking room. It wasn't actually decorative. This is a grill vent cover for where the warm, fresh air would enter the room from the boiler casing. Now that the air was being warmed, the designers had to find a way to keep it so within the ship, because believe it or not, bare steel doesn't do a very good job of keeping heat in, especially when the outside temperatures can reach around 3 degrees Celsius. Insulation was used to protect Titanic's first and second class passengers from the freezing cold steel. Third class passengers weren't so lucky, but at least their air was being heated to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Obviously the bare steel in the majority of first and second class was clad with timber panelling, but first the builders installed insulation to partly dampen the effects of the outside cold. The insulation ranged from appearing like a fibrous horsehair material to being more like canvas cloth. 
In other parts of the ship though, there was a different issue. The Titanic's funnel uptakes reared up high through the ship, right through passenger spaces like cabins and the dining saloon. The uptakes carried the superheated furnace gases and coal smoke up and out of the boilers to the ship's funnels and they ran hot. Made of steel plating, the uptakes could be up to 300 degrees Celsius or 570 degrees Fahrenheit. Where they crossed into passenger spaces, they were hidden behind bulkheads and panelling of course, but very heavily insulated with cork. Tons and tons of cork. Without it providing a buffer between the uptakes and the public room walls, the temperature would be unbearable, especially for inside staterooms. Huge slabs of cork, up to 18 inches or 45 centimetres thick, were installed to prevent heat from escaping out. And after the Titanic sank, a huge amount of cork could be seen floating on the surface. The ship had broken up, and it's likely the cork panels were shredded during the sinking and floated free to the surface. The cork was also used in the ship's refrigerators to insulate the cold storage from the room temperature outside. So that's how they did it. I mean, Scirocco fans weren't particularly unique for the time. A lot of other ocean liners like the Lusitania and the Mauritania had used them years before. Because Olympic and Titanic used more powered vents than many other ships at the time, they could boast decks which were relatively uncluttered. Just compare the Titanic's boat deck with that of a German liner, which was just a few years older, where fewer and smaller powered fans were used. It's just another example of the clever engineering that went into construction of what were then the world's greatest ships. Today, many of the Scirocco fans still survive, intact and in place on the wreck, although they won't be there for much longer. But because they're made out of very thin steel, they're being eaten away at, just like the ship itself. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please think about liking and subscribing to the channel. You can support my channel on Patreon. You'll find the link down in the description. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.